Okay, well, hi everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Conversations with a Pro Trader. I'm your host, Greta Wall, and today I'm joined by T Free Trading Group senior trader, Derek Olden Smith, who is also the leader of the Pro Desk virtual trading floor with T Free Live. Hi, Derek. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, Greta. Glad to be back. All right. So our first question uh, for all of these events is: How would you grade your week of trading so far? We're halfway through the week. Give me your your grade. I'm back to trading really well, I'm happy to say. I remember the last time you had me on, I was upset with my trading because I had made some errors and some mistakes on on game planning and and I tend to be really hard on myself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, th the way that I judge my own trading if I'm giving myself a, a letter grade is not necessarily based on P&L. It's based on how good of a job I've done being consistent with following my rules, uh, taking the trades at, at the appropriate time with the appropriate sizing, the appropriate risk, having a game plan in place, and then consistently following that game plan. And mm -hmm. I can say that so far for, for this week and probably for last week also, I've pretty much perfectly followed my rules. So if I perfectly followed my rules with no mistakes, the PL doesn't matter. The PL is secondary it, it comes as a result of doing the right things then i got to give myself a, a solid a or a plus again great great to hear um so for everyone who is joining us today if it's your first time here welcome if you're coming back welcome back uh, these are live conversations between derek and myself but also a live q a for you and derek so as you're watching this event the live chat is open i am going to put a comment in there right now just so you guys can uh, see where it's at. Ask Derek your questions there, and he will answer those uh, in this in the latter half of this event. So first half here, Derek and I will have a conversation. If you hear anything that you want more clarification on, or you have a, a question about something else uh, totally unrelated to what we're talking about, please submit those questions, and I will make sure we answer all of them by the end of this event. Okay, Derek, so we do have a lot to talk about today. There's kind of a lot of news happening uh, impacting the stock market. I want to start off, though, with the debt ceiling. Negotiators, as of today, still unable to come to an agreement to raise the debt limit. House Speaker says the two sides are still far apart on spending cuts. Treasury Secretary reiterating today that June 1, or early June, is the deadline to raise the limit. She says government is out of money after early June. We're about a week away from that deadline now. So give me your thoughts on this situation. Sure. So uh, unfortunately, this isn't the first time over the course of my career. I've dealt with this debt ceiling stuff. And then the, the U.S. government and our politicians, they love to play these games. And they do it at risk of the entire populace of the country. I, mm -hmm. I personally find it embarrassing um, you know, not to get into politics or Democrat, Republican, any of that stuff. That's not ever what I want to talk about when I'm working with my team. I, I always want to talk about very specifically the market implications of situations that we find ourselves in. And sometimes those situations are politically based as is this one. So mm -hmm. there, there's no doubt about it. If a, if a deal can't come to pass, if we default in our debt as the United States of America, it is an absolute and utter disaster. Uh, it would probably be terrible for markets. I mean, the move lower for markets would, would probably be extraordinary. I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, I mm -hmm. think that we're going to get the, the deal passed. It's honestly something I'm only slightly concerned about at this point, to be honest, even as we're you know really starting to approach our deadline. it's Yesterday was the first day that I saw the market actually move based on headlines coming mm -hmm. out of the White House and, and the, our politicians about the situation. And it did bring us lower. Um, the fact that no deal was able to be done yesterday is what really called, uh, caused us to roll over in the second half of the day. It actually kind of caused a fake take, uh, a false technical breakout in the S&P and the Russell, which is, which is certainly no good. Uh, but I, I think that the deal is gonna get done if for no other reason than the politicians have political risk here. And you know what I always tell my traders, and it doesn't matter what we're talking about specifically, you could be talking about Wall Street analysts, you could be talking about hedge fund managers, or in this case, you could be talking about politicians. Mm -hmm. You want to ask yourself, what is the incentive of this person? What, what is their mm -hmm. number one incentive? And I talk about this all the time. Like uh, a Wall Street analyst, 
their number one incentive is not necessarily to provide information to the markets that will make you or or, or me money. Uh, mm-hmm. A hedge fund manager, their number one incentive is not necessarily to make money for their clients either. Um, mm-hmm. A hedge fund manager, their number number one incentive is is raising assets and keeping those assets. And when it comes to politicians, in my opinion, unfortunately, um, their number one incentive is not doing what's best for the American people, their number one incentive is getting reelected. And when you look at a situation like this, if they don't get a deal done, then there is re-election risk that they're putting on their own shoulders. And at the end of the day, these people are going to do whatever they need to do in order to get reelected, which means that no one will want to have their name on on either side of the aisle. No one's going to want to have their name associated with not getting a deal done. Mm -hmm. And as a result, potentially not getting reelected. They will get a deal done. I'm very confident about it. So I, I personally think that this is all noise right now. But as of yesterday, it did start to create some some movements with the market. So we need to see progress. And I'll tell you what, I, I said it in the virtual trading for today. These politicians better cancel their Memorial Day weekend plans if they think that they're going on vacation Memorial Day weekend. Lock yourself in a room, get a deal done, do what's right by the American people. This is your job. Don't, don't, Mm -hmm. the the one headline I do not want to see is, oh, we're going to recess our conversations until Tuesday so we can go and enjoy our Memorial Day weekend. It's just ridiculous. But I'm not concerned overall. (laughs) I would say arguably most people aren't that concerned that a default is going to happen. It's pretty much a given that they will come to some kind of agreement, even if it's a kick the can down the road, short term, three month agreement. But as you mentioned, we're starting to see more impact on the stock market, specifically from these headlines having to do with the debt ceiling. Why do you think now is kind of the time that we're starting to see that impact among traders? Sure. So well, one is just because we're getting closer and closer to the deadline. But mm-hmm. there's one really interesting thing that I, I've heard from a, a couple of resources uh, in doing my own research right now is the debt ceiling actually being a lose-lose situation mm-hmm. for markets. So obviously, if no deal gets done, it's, it's a complete and utter disaster. That's the obvious lose for markets. And I think that people think that if they get the deal done, then it's obviously good for markets. And and the risk is off the table and the market will move higher on it. And I think that's true. And I think that will especially be true as an initial reaction. If right now, well, you and I are having this interview, uh, they announced that they got a deal done, I would definitely expect at least a short-term rip higher in in the market futures. Mm -hmm. But getting a deal done means that the treasury has to kind of refill their coffers, which sucks liquidity out of the market. They're also gonna be issuing a lot more debt so that adds that adds debt supply, it adds bond supply to to the market, and markets function as supply and demand. So mm-hmm. we we could be actually looking at a situation here that is a lose lose, and and I thought that that was a a pretty interesting thought process and take, and it's something I've got in the back of my mind. But whenever I have a thesis for the market or a thought process for the market, like what I just explained, I always need the technicals to confirm it. Mm -hmm. And the technicals have been extremely bullish, but now I'm looking at, as of potentially yesterday slash today, a false breakout in the S&P and a false breakout in the Russell. And, you know, maybe that's actually the market technicals kind of confirming the thesis of a lose-lose situation off the debt ceiling. Yeah, I was kind of, I was reading really similar analysis about kind of the lose-lose situation with, especially with the, the bond market and how this will impact uh, the debt that the treasury department then has to take on if a deal is is made, et cetera, et cetera. So it is definitely still something to focus on even if, even if slash when a deal is made, how it impacts those parts of the market. Okay, so next we have uh, the Fed minutes. Those came out earlier today. The bank released the minutes of its May meeting again earlier today. And, that, and this readout was, you know, I would say more important than maybe previous Fed minutes that we've gotten over the past few months. The past few months of the hiking cycle have been, we know what they're going to do. They're going to keep hiking, hiking, hiking until inflation is under control. But this was our first minutes where the discussion was centered around, when are we ready to stop uh, hiking rates? Uh, The the quote from the minutes was that participants generally expressed uncertainty about how much more policy tightening may be appropriate. Many participants focused on the need to retain optionality after this meeting. So basically, uh, like the statement said, they talked about 
remaining data dependent moving forward. What was your reaction to today's minutes and the sentiment on, among Fed officials? Sure. So I, I don't think that today's minutes gave us anything new. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's always what's important is if something new comes out or something surprising comes out, because that that's what actually moves markets. And, you know, traditionally, the, the Fed meetings can give really big movements to the markets mm -hmm. and Fed minutes where we kind of just get more information about them about the meeting. They tend to give us a lot of volatility around their release, which is, mm -hmm. happens at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, they tend to give a lot of volatility a, a, a around the, the release, but not necessarily direction, because, again, there's oftentimes nothing new as far as the information coming. I, I was actually really surprised today at the lack of volatility off the minutes. U usually we see some kind of rap it up and down of the algorithms going, going kind of crazy, and we didn't even really see much of that at all. It was a very small uptick followed by a relatively small downtick in the market. Mm -hmm. Um but again, primarily a, a repeat of, of what we already know from when Jerome Powell has, has spoken. They're going to be data dependent, obviously. They're, they're signaling a pause, provided that the data continues to move in the right direction. Mm -hmm. They're trying to balance what a recession could look like with bringing inflation down. They also did, did say in the Fed minutes today that they are still expecting a mild recession in the second half of, of 2023, which is interesting. But again, that's kind of the soft landing chatter that the market seems to already be be pricing in at this point. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing different there. The, the big thing is really still just um, what the Fed futures have been pricing in. And, and you and I have spoken about this in the past. I, I, I remember last time we spoke or the time before that, the, the Fed was pricing in like four cuts by the end mm -hmm. of this year. And yeah. we, were, we were talking about like, well, that's, that just seems kind of crazy based on the actual Fed messaging, unless one of two things happen, we dive into a really deep recession, which I still don't think is going to happen, or inflation starts coming down rapidly and around 2%. So I think mm -hmm. that that's the big thing to still pay attention to. And the market's done a, a pretty good job of holding up as those expectations for Fed cuts have lessened. So mm -hmm. I think last I saw now, they're only expecting maybe two cuts by the end of this yeah. year and one in the beginning of next year, something like that. And now they're mm -hmm. also actually pricing like a 20 to 25% probability of a, of another Fed increase another hike, in, yeah. in, of another hike in, in, in the next meeting. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to say what I've been saying for a year and a half, which is that the Fed uses as a tool their words and their language. They like to tell us what they're going to do ahead of time. You, you haven't, you didn't need to be a rocket scientist over the course of the last year and a half to know exactly how much the Fed was going to hike every single time they were going to hike because they told you. And I, and I still think that the exact same thing is going on. I think that, mm -hmm. that even though now we're seeing a 20, 25% probability of a hike in June, and we're still seeing uh, two or three cuts into the end of this year, the beginning of next year, I don't see any of that happening. I think that Jerome Powell has already signaled to us that he is not going to hike. He's not going to cut on the on the June meeting unless something dramatic happens with the data. I'm not expecting anything dramatic dramatic to happen with the data. They understand that when they hike interest rates, there's a really big lag effect on that. They need mm -hmm. to wait to see what that lag effect actually does to the economy and does to does to inflation. So I'm saying unless we see something that's a disaster on like this next PCE report. There is going to be no hike, and but I'm also saying that there is going to be probably no cuts this year. They're going to yeah. just stay exactly where they are, and then the, the markets need to slowly price that in over time, and then we'll see if the market, the equity market, can hold in as well as it has mm -hmm. as the market has started to to move away from from some of those potential cuts. Several Fed officials have hit the speaking circuit this week, and they've seemed to kind of strike down the idea that they might be done hiking. You mentioned this. We're starting to kind of see this possibility of another 25 basis point hike sometime this year. Maybe not in June, but maybe at the next meeting sometime before the end of the year. Uh, the Dallas Fed president, who is a voting member of the FOMC, so her opinion seem, you know, holds a little bit more weight compared to some other officials, uh, she said uh, last week that she does not support a pause at this point in rate hikes because the data does not support it, but she would be reliant on the data coming out ahead of the next meeting, namely the PC price index this week, the jobs report next week. James Bullard, the St. Louis Fed president, who's you know the quintessential hawk on the Fed, um, he 
says that we need two more rate hikes this year uh, to get inflation under control. What do you think is the bigger risk here for the central bank causing a bad recession or stopping too soon and not actually getting inflation down to their target? Sure. So the, the first comment that comes to my head, as you're saying, that is, is once again that these Fed members, and, and especially Jerome Powell, they understand that actually one of their tools to help them uh, achieve their goals of, of maximum unemployment and stable stable pricing is their words. So mm -hmm. we've seen this also very consistently over the course of the last year and a half. Every single time the market starts performing well, the language that comes from the Fed members is more hawkish. Every single time we're seeing the market really crater down, the language from these Fed officials become much more dovish. And that's because what the Fed is trying to do, and I think that they've actually done an excellent job so far to, to give them some credit, is they are walking this tightrope right now. They don't want the markets to go up too much because that will create a wealth effect. Wealth effect can continue to increase inflation. But they also don't want these markets to completely crash because that becomes almost a self-fulfilling prophecy where markets getting completely destroyed has an effect on, on the economy a, a, as well. Yeah. So I think that they're doing a great job using their language. Um, you know, they're going to be data dependent. It's it's a vote, right? So it's not just, uh, who, who did you say was the Dallas Fed member, um, Fed president that wants to Logan. still- Logan. I don't actually right. remember her first Logan. name, but Logan. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I think it also starts with an L. I can't it remember is. Either. I just can't remember. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Logan, okay, so she, so she wants to do a 25 basis point increase. And Bullard, who is the biggest hawk out there, wants to do two, but he's not a voting member. So, mm -hmm. you know, is it worth paying attention to what he says? Of course it is. You know, smart person. We should know what he's thinking. But I... I'm not going to be overly concerned about about either of their language at this point. I, I still think yeah. it's that, like they said, data dependent. They they want to leave the window open in case inflation starts really increasing again and they have to hide. Right. Yeah. But I don't think they want to marry themselves to a pause because right. then they look like they lied versus just saying, well, we'll just be data dependent, and then they could kind of just do whatever they want based on the data, and then they yeah. they've done what they said they were going to do. And, and it helps keep a little bit of a lid on the market as well. And like we were saying, I, I still think until we see inflation come down that they're actually incentivized to not let the stock market go up too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just for everyone who is here with us live, I do see those questions starting to roll in, but please submit them in the live chat as we continue through about the first 30 minutes here, Derek and I will talk and then I'll get to those audience questions in the second half. Um, so Derek, speaking of being data dependent for the Fed, we will get another look at the inflation picture this Friday with the April PCE price index coming out at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. Uh, the core PCE price index is what the Fed says is their preferred inflation gauge. The market typically pays a lot closer attention to the CPI, the consumer price index, and these PCE price indexes aren't really as much of a mover for the market as the CPI is. But this is the last piece of inflation data that the Fed will get before that June 14th meeting, two weeks, or three weeks rather, from today. So do you think that puts more weight behind uh, this week's report than usual? You know, it's funny. I, I had almost barely ever even heard of PCE <laughs> until this inflation situation started happening and Jerome Powell came out and said that that's their the Fed's preferred measure of inflation. Uh, the mm -hmm. CPI was, you know, what I've always looked at, what I've always really heard of and focused on my entire trading career and even back a long time ago when I was an economics major in college. Uh, so sure, you know, this next PCE number, this next jobs number, that's going to be really important because if it's a disaster, then, you know, maybe we actually do get a June hike. I still, th still don't think that's going to happen. I think that uh, inflation is going to continue to be in a pattern of lower highs and lower lows over time and work it, work its way down. But it's a downtrend, right? And people need to understand that a downtrend means that sometimes you get little pops in order to, in order to come back down. But what matters mm -hmm. is what the number is versus expectations, because that's what the market price is in. So as yeah. long as we're not ridiculously high versus expectations, then I think that we're looking at this at this pause. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so now let's talk about kind of the big news of the day for Wall Street, the big after hours news, especially happening and impacting the market, you know, as we're speaking, and that is NVIDIA. Earnings is 
season is winding down, but the chipmaker did just report results after the close today. Saw a huge beat on both the top and bottom line in the fiscal first quarter and major guidance from NVIDIA. You and I were talking about this uh, before we went live here. Huge guidance for the second quarter. Give me your reaction to this report and how you would, if you're going to or hypothetically, uh, would approach this stock in tomorrow's session. Yeah, um, I'm looking at this thing making new after high, after hours highs right now and coming into 395. I didn't look at it yeah. when we, when, since we've been doing our, our interview here. Um, this thing was like thirty dollars lower when mm -hmm. when you and I were setting up the the Zoom for for this meeting, and it's up another thirty bucks from there. It's approaching, working towards four hundred dollars. Yeah. I'd be really curious to know uh, what dollar amount for the stock price. Nvidia hits a trillion dollar market cap. We got to be getting mm -hmm. close. I, I think it was like a seven hundred fifty billion dollar market cap, uh, mm -hmm. like coming into today, and now it's up twenty seven. 30% after hours. I mean, <laughs> the guidance number was absolutely nuts. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Q2 revenue guidance expectations of, I, I think, $7 billion. And, and they and they said, we think we're going to do 11. I mm -hmm. mean, that number is insane for a, a company like this. I think at this point, it's moved like two and a half, three X with the measured options move was. Yeah. <laughs> I think the measured the options move was like 16 bucks heading into this yeah, report. We're yeah, we're up like 80 right now. Mm -hmm. um, this, this, is, this is just completely, completely crazy. Uh, I mean, they crushed it, and I, I don't know what else to say about it. AI uh, I, I, is the future? I don't know. Um, <laughs> we, we, took a, we took a vote in the VTF today. I just assume that, that Josh Leffler uh, posted this this uh, poll in the VTF, it seemed like a Josh Leffler poll. Um, how how many times is AI going to be mentioned in the NVIDIA uh, conference mm -hmm. call? And I, and I actually don't know what the results came out as. Let me, let me check. I, I said more than 20. Um, mm -hmm. The choices were less than 10, between 10 and 20, more than 20. I said more than 20, as did, I guess, 72% of the people in my VTF who, who, who voted on that. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't even know what else to say. I mean, it, it's, it's a mind-blowingly amazing guidance call on an earnings report that absolutely crushed it in a stock that, by the way, had a huge move going into the report, which yeah. usually that means it's even more difficult for the stock to give continuation on a good report. You know, I, I, I remember in um, just 2022 buying this thing at like $112. And I, and I think I caught a move up to like 150 or 180 or something. And I thought it was a genius and got out of it. And now it's, you know, approaching 400 bucks here after, after hours. It's uh, mm -hmm. insane. So insane. For, and, and it's moving the entire NASDAQ. Sorry, I could yeah. keep ranting and raving about this <laughs> yeah. report. It, the, the entire NASDAQ is a huge after hours off of this. Mm -hmm. uh, the queues closed around 331.60. We just we were above 337. So I don't know. It's going to be really interesting. It, so. Earnings season in the end of April and early May, when we saw most companies report, was was really interesting from the perspective of markets because there were two occasions here where the S and P looked like it wanted to break down, and then mm -hmm. they got saved by big tech on both times. Yeah. On mm -hmm. um, April twenty fifth to April twenty sixth, the market really started to roll over heavy, and then I think that might even been when we last spoke. Um, I think mm -hmm. then we had Google report and and Microsoft yeah. report. Mm -hmm. And they ripped the entire market higher. And then the same thing happened. We, we, we looked like we were about to fail in the S&P on May 4th. So just like a, a week later. And I forget who reported that night. Uh, maybe it was maybe that was the Amazon report. I don't exactly remember. Don't remember. Um, but then the next day, one of, one of the big tech companies came out and saved us again. And now uh, I'm basically looking at a confirmed failed breakout of SPX 4200 in the S&P. I'm looking at the the IWM ETF with a with a failed breakout yesterday above 180, and the IWM is not moving off this after hours because the IWM doesn't care about Nvidia. The, the spies definitely do, and mm -hmm. this might just now immediately negate this failed breakout and get us right back above our, our key levels. It's it's going to be really interesting if for the third time in about a month here, big tech comes in and, and saves this entire marketplace. 
So if you were to talk through a strategy on NVIDIA for tomorrow's session, coming into a session with, you know, an after hours move of, you know, over 20%, likely a pre-market move of really large, num you know, percentages as well. We, of course, don't know until tomorrow morning. Um, how would someone approach this stock successfully? Say they didn't have a position going into the earnings report, but maybe they want to open a position after the report. What would be a strategy that if you were going to do that yourself, you would use on this stock? It, it's going to be really difficult to trade this thing tomorrow morning if you don't have a position. Uh, and I'm kicking myself because I, I saw that guidance number hit and the video was still trading at like 330, 333. And I, and I thought about just taking the offer and getting involved and I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't touch it and I missed my opportunity. So now tomorrow morning, this thing is going to open up just massively extended on the daily chart. Mm -hmm. So you can, have, you can find day trading opportunities, you know, if you're a, a pattern day trader and you're looking at, you know, technical patterns and small time frames. I mean, this thing is going to be moving in a really big way. So you got to make sure you have your risk management in check and it's appropriate. But when these things gap up this big, I, I usually find them to be generally pretty difficult to trade that next day. Mm -hmm. You always want to know what your after hours levels are because the after hours levels, when the stock trades with a lot of volume, which NVIDIA is doing right now, are usually pretty important the next day. So just kind of mm -hmm. eyeballing it, it looks like, you know, 367 to 370 ish was acting as some resistance uh, about 45 minutes ago or so. So that area might be notable on a technical pullback. Uh, right mm -hmm. now, the high is, is 395 to the, to, the, to the penny. So that's our only after hours resistance. So the more immediate levels based on the price action thus far that I would pay attention to, and it does not necessarily mean I put on a trade. It just mm -hmm. means that these are notable levels and I'll probably have an alert system out of my trading software. And if they get to those notable levels, I'll type it up. I'll look at it. I'll see if a, if a trade is presenting itself. Mm -hmm. But those numbers I just kind of mentioned, those support and resistance levels would be areas that I would pay attention to tomorrow to potentially find the trades. But for me, for my own approach, Everything I do, I like to base off the daily the daily picture. I like mm -hmm. to base everything off the daily picture, and then I like to use my five and fifteen minute charts, my smaller time frames, basically for execution of what I see on that daily picture. That can enable me to get daily chart big big picture reward potential on my trades for small time frame risk, and mm -hmm. and that's I think the ultimate risk reward. If you can find risk that's on a five minute chart, but then this trade's working out, and you get reward that's on a daily chart, that's when you're getting your 10 X's, your 20 X's, your 50 X's. So that's, that's what I want to be able to pay attention to. And when I have a stock that gaps up this big into all time highs, there's, there's nothing for me to look at on the daily chart. I need to wait. I, pro I probably would need to wait in order for the first real daily chart setup to come in, unless this thing for some reason sells all the way back down tomorrow, if the stock's able to hold up at all. With this big of a gap, it's probably going to take at least a week of price action. And it was the same thing with, with Meta's earnings report. Um, they had that huge gap up. And I think with Mike, Microsoft had a, had a really big gap up as well. They were just so big of gaps that, I mean, Meta, you had to wait. The really daily chart, daily chart picture did not reset itself up. Meta reported on April 27th. And I think the first time I really called out like a couple trades to my team was first on like April, uh, sorry, on May 8th. So what's that? It's like eight trading sessions later. Mm -hmm. And then the next kind of daily chart call out we had was on like May 12th or, or 15th on, on the break of, three, of 236 on the upside. So when you have this big of a gap, it just takes a long time to digest that earnings report, digest that gap to give me setups. But if you're you know a small time frame day trader, you can take some day trades tomorrow if, if the setups present themselves. You mentioned you're kind of kicking yourself for not taking the trade uh, in the after hours session where you saw maybe some opportunity. Uh, so as a professional trader, how do you keep yourself from, you know, falling victim to FOMO on, you know, big moves in stocks like this? Uh, sure. So I think if I bought, you know, 330, 333 off that report, it, it wouldn't have been FOMO. I think it would have been kind of appropriate based on, on the news that I was right, seeing. Right, but you didn't. And now, like, how do you, like, prevent right. the FOMO from taking over and being like, oh, I'm just going to do it now? Sure. So um, it's just not my edge. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. So I, I, FOMO, at this point in my career, 
and I would not say it's always been that way, is not something that affects me from, from a trading perspective. And I know it affects a lot of people. Um, the, the most difficult thing for most traders, if they're like not super, super new, but they've been doing this for a little while, is is themselves it's the most difficult thing like once you have gotten yourself if you're like a brand new trader you got to get yourself through the mechanical learning curve of understanding how markets work of how, how of understanding how execution works but if you are doing this for two years let's just say three years you probably by that point have a pretty good understanding of your bids and offers and you know chart patterns and and all the mechanical stuff and then it becomes all about about trading psychology and what I tell people all the time is that the number one counter to bad trading psychology is good game planning. Good game planning, having a rules-based approach, and then this goes back to psychology, having the discipline to be able to follow that rules-based approach, which mm -hmm. that always sounds so easy in like an interview or a phone call or something like that. Well, you just create your rules, and then you follow them, and you could be a really successful trader. Yeah. And as traders learn, once they start doing this for a couple of years, it is not that easy. The market will do everything it possibly can to, to mess with your psychology and to get you to do the wrong things. But at this point in my career, I mean, like the reason I gave myself an A and A plus in the beginning of our conversation today, which I did not last time we had an interview, I gave myself like a D, um, is because I have been perfectly disciplined over the course of this week and the last couple of weeks with my approach and with my rules. And those rules would dictate to me to not be chasing $190 in NVIDIA if the trade setup was at was at 330 Not be mm -hmm. chasing price and having FOMO and just, close. I, that's not how you're going to be able to make money. It's just, oh my God, I can't believe I missed the trade. I would have made a million dollars if I just bought at 330 like I was going to. And then, and then traders love to blame everybody but themselves. So mm -hmm. I'm going to blame Greta Wall because <laughs> if I didn't have to do this interview with Greta, then I would have bought, you know, uh, 330 in NVIDIA today. So mm -hmm. you just got to follow your rules-based approach. It's really what it comes down to. Mm, sorry, I interrupted that, uh, that opportunity for you, Derek. <laughs> All right. So I do want to get to some audience questions here for everyone that's watching. Uh, submit more questions uh, if you have them. But we do have two good ones lined up here, Derek. So our first comes from Tyler. And he asked, how do you determine a daily stop? Do you calculate your average point gain slash winning trades per day and cut it at a certain negative value, assuming you trade intraday, or do you have a daily stop per strategy or kind of a stop rule as a whole? Well, so, so when um, you say daily stop, what I assume that you mean is, is what I refer to as we call it a limit down or a max loss for the day, mm -hmm. meaning when you say like when you say daily stop, I don't want anybody to be confused, or maybe I'm the one that's confused with like a stop loss for a particular trade. I think the I think, question I, is, I think is based on like a, a daily loss because they asked, do you calculate right. your average point gain slash winning trades per day and then cut it at a certain negative value? So overall loss, right? Yeah, yeah, yep. that, 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 that's what that's what I thought also. So um, I, I, the way that I like to do it broadly is, is kind of just based on a percentage of your account. That's what you, you know, what, what is the maximum amount of your account that you're willing to lose in a typical day in order, in order to be able to make money? Um, that answer will very much depend on, on the individual. Mm -hmm. I don't know you. You need to know yourself. You need to know how much money you have. You need to know what your finances look like, what your family finances look like, all that, all that good stuff, what, you, what you're working with. But like as a as a very general broad rule, like if I was onboarding a new prop trader into T three trading group, I usually mm -hmm. like to have a conversation with them before they first start trading about what their maximum daily risk should look like. I don't like when someone gives me an answer that's more than five percent of their account. I, I think it's just too much. So I would say it should be something less than five percent, and you need to come up with that number for yourself based on your own understanding of your own finances. Um, and then you can skew your risk per trade based off what that amount is. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you are working, just, I always like to use simple numbers. If you were working with a $10,000 account, then 5%, you know, you're looking at $500 as like the maximum, maximum loss that you should give for yourself. And then you could break your trades up to, and there should be some variability based on what I call risk skew. Uh, but then you can break your trades up into, 
let's say an average of $100 risk per trade, that gives you five opportunities per day. If you took five trades in, in your day and every single one of them failed, you should be done for the day. Um, you're not seeing things right. You're not seeing the market right. Your thought process was wrong. You didn't get enough sleep last night. Whatever it is, take a step back and, and, and call it. I have analyzed my account and the account of many people that I have worked with, probably 100 plus accounts of people that I've worked with over the years to try to help them. And I can tell you, whatever your trading strategy is, this business comes down to the math. It comes down to the numbers. Having mm -hmm. that maximum loss, whatever you make for yourself, is a prerequisite for success. And then you need to be able to have game plans so that your reward potential can be a multiple of what that what that maximum loss is. So if you will allow yourself to lose $500 in a day, use those simple numbers in, in, as an example, then you should be able to have at least a couple of days every month where you're making a solid multiple of that you know, three, four, five, 10 X that, that amount, you, you know, you can make 2000 bucks in a day, $4,000 in a day. And if you can do that consistently, just run the numbers, you know, like if you never let yourself lose more than 500 bucks and just every once in a while, you can throw in a two, $3,000 a day numbers are going to end up working out in your favor where it's going to be really difficult for you to look back at the end of the month and actually see yourself as, as negative. Mm -hmm. So that that's what it comes down to. It's really important. And that's usually how I like to do it. Yeah, I think it was great. All right. Our next question is how do you back test seasonality of any given edge? What worked well in 2020 to 2022 is having a drag downs in current market environment. How does one prepare for the coming years once interest rates hikes are paused? Uh, sure. So the, um, I'm trying to figure out how, how exactly I want to answer this question, because on the one hand, I think that knowing and understanding history is extremely important. You mm -hmm. want to know and understand history. You want to have an understanding of what has happened in the past. Uh, history doesn't necessarily repeat, but it often rhymes, right? And that's a saying that, that, that people intelligently utilize. So you want to have an understanding of you know, what has happened in the past when the Fed has stopped hiking, when the Fed has started cutting, you know, what has, what have happened, what have other market environments look like? That's mm -hmm. no guarantee that this market environment will also look like that, but it's an mm -hmm. important piece of knowledge that you can fit in. I don't like to back test though, um, because market environments are constantly changing and every situation is truly unique from every other. And I've seen it with algorithmic traders and all types of traders that want to backtest and they find some strategy that worked on, on from a backtesting perspective, and then they start to implement it and it, and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I really prefer more of like a forward testing type of system. What, like, okay, I know what the, what the market environment has looked like historically in certain situations, but what does the market environment actually look like now in this current situation? And, mm -hmm. and we've been in kind of a unique environment here the last couple of months where we have been in an extraordinarily tight environment that actually started to break out at the end of last week. But we just had like almost a month and a half or so of very tight sideways price action. I think mm -hmm. I saw that from a daily chart volatility perspective, it was like the lowest change day over day going back to 2017. But within that, there has been very high intraday volatility, which mm -hmm. is which is really interesting and unique. I'm not sure I've ever really seen that before. Like I remember 2015, where the market had had one period of time where it went very sideways in a tight range, but there was also no intraday volatility. And that made that was a very tough environment. This is different. When we were going through that sideways tight range, there was a lot of intraday volatility. And why is that? Well, there's been a lot of interesting information and, and stats that you can read or if you remember the ProDesk virtual trading floor, you can read my partner Pat's daily note where he's been getting a lot of this information and data in there. Uh, JP Morgan mm -hmm. just dropped a research note about it, I think last week as well. That's talking about how that specific market environment structure that we've just seen over the course of these last couple of months is specifically being brought on by the advent of zero DT options, zero, zero data expiration options. Um, so if, if you're going back and you're looking at, I don't know, 
like the 1980s or or some other period of time when we were in a you know let me try to find a, an environment that was similar historically and back test based off that and, and develop a trading strategy around it okay you know in 1980s and inflation was coming down and uh the, the fed you know stopped hiking and then eventually they 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 started um uh bringing interest rates a little bit lower and you implement a strategy that's based off back testing from that period of time but you're not counting into a fact uh, in, into effect the modern market that has this zero DTE mm-hmm. options expiration phenomenon that, that that's kind of going on right now that's having a big effect on market dynamics then you're you're missing a massive piece of the puzzle so mm-hmm. I, I more like to understand that every environment is unique but it can be similar to other environments that, they, that I've seen in the past what is the dynamic of this environment that I'm actually in in this moment and what strategies logically make the most amount of sense? And then based on what I think makes sense logically, as I'm trading day to day, keeping statistics on that data. And then you can have a system for yourself of ramping up risk and ramping up PL based on the data being good. You're trading well, basically, you're making money. So put scale to it and do it a bigger way or, or the opposite. You're implementing strategies based on how you're perceiving the, perceiving the current market environment. And those strategies are not working very well. And you need to make, you need to bring those numbers down, figure out what changes you need to make in your strategies. I've seen a lot of people, um, there's been a lot of people I've seen who have not been happy with this environment over the course of the last couple couple of months. And they were Mm -hmm. using strategies that were working for them previously and they have not been working now and they're kind of pulling their hair out. Uh, I did an afternoon meeting that you can find on my YouTube I think on Thursday of last week, where I I went into what changes I'm making with my own trading strategies that I'm doing differently based on this market environment where I'm I'm having really good success off those strategies. Mm -hmm. But to sum it up, you know, like this, this environment has not been paying me necessarily extremely well on my swing positions overall even though I have been in, in honestly, probably half of the big seven stocks that have moved the S&P this entire year. And that's obviously helped me from the swing perspective. But the adjustments that I've made on being less greedy, looking for bigger picture moves, and a lot more of these kind of cash flow strategies of selling stock and buying it back in lower prices to be able to work those ranges that we've been in and that larger intraday volatility has worked really well for me. And, and um. Outside of my SVB loss that I'm still nursing, um, I, I've been having a phenomenal calendar year so far just by making the right adjustments. Right. And that's important to note, like you're adjusting to the current market environment, not just continuing to do what's been proven to not maybe work for you. Our next question is based on or is about how you find stocks to trade. So uh, he asked, do you trade based on the use of stock scanners or mostly on your watch list? What criteria do you use to develop your watch list? Uh, the number one thing I use for research on trades that I'm potentially going to get involved in is the ProDesk virtual trading floor. And mm-hmm. I highly encourage everybody to check it out. I'm not kidding. I, I've got like a couple of basic watch lists built into my trading software. Um, I have a universe of, you know, probably 50 stocks that I go back to very regularly and I look at all the time. But I, I literally use the ProDesk virtual trading floor for, for everything. Um, mm-hmm. It's awesome. Uh, we get the news in there real time. You know, we've got an attachment with Benzinga Net News now too, which is great. But uh, ProDesk was already getting the, the news into the virtual trading floor better than Benzinga provides. So I don't even use the Benzinga. Um, we get the news in there real time. We get all the research in the morning, all the analyst upgrades and downgrades, earnings reports, macro research. Uh, that's entirely what I'm util- utilizing. So I, I see that stuff coming in real time. I use it for idea generation. And then I, I use my team. You know, we, the, the virtual trading floor and the team that I work with is a team. And I think that that's really important. And that's why we call it the ProDesk room. It's a, it's a group of people who are primarily professional traders who are doing this for a living and, and, and working on being successful. And it's a give and take. I like to think that I provide ideas that make other people on the team money. And other people on the team provide ideas that make me money. Uh, some of the positions I'm in right now, I think it was just um, yesterday that I bought plug through 
uh, eight dollar uh, two days ago. I bought plugs for eight dollars. Not my idea. Elliot in the virtual trading tour. If he's if he's listening again, shout out to Elliot. Uh, it was his idea. He brought it up in the morning meeting. I was like, oh, I love this idea. This is great. Bam, trade triggered. I'm in. Uh, the PayPal position that I that I've done pretty well with uh, over the course of the last. Um, I've been in this one. I think since may 17th so probably five days now it's paid me really well uh not my idea i don't remember whose idea it was so i apologize for not giving the, the, the right credit but you know i'm working with a team of traders here and we feed off of one another that's all i need i don't need scanners i don't need anything else mm -hmm. our next question comes from franklin and it's uh, about t3 trading and being a prop trader with T3. He said he, I am assuming that T3 prop traders get a K1 when it's time to file their taxes. Are their profits considered earned income or passive income? Uh, yes, you get a K1 if you're a prop trader with T3. Beyond that, I am not an accountant. <laughs> uh, I'm going to certainly recommend that you speak to your accountant. I, I think that it shows up in the ordinary income line of the K1. Mm -hmm. um, but again, outside of that, you should you should speak to an accountant. And I think there might be tax benefits to a K one versus a 1099, but speak to speak to a tax professional. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Tyler uh, first said thank you for answering his first question, and then he has a, a second question. He asked, "Have you seen an increase and in, have you seen an increase in programmatic trading via Python slash C plus plus? Do you know?" What I'm referring to? Okay. Yeah, C plus C plus plus. It's a okay. Coded Rather, language. okay. Just making sure. Rather than a combination of software with human execution. If so, are there particular platforms ideal for this that you're aware of? And does T3 have a focus in automated trading? Sure. So, um, I don't know the statistics now, but the percentage of the overall volume in the market that's brought on by automated algorithmic trading has been very high for like a long time now, um, mm -hmm. probably at least 10 years. So I don't know, I don't know if there is necessarily an increase in pro programmatic trading that's actually occurring. It's been a very large percentage at this point for a very long time. I think that there probably is an increase in sophistication of mm -hmm. algorithmic trading uh, now compared to, you know, 10, 12 years ago. Um, I remember, you know, 12 years ago, you you could see these algorithms come into the level two, and they were just so poorly done and so poorly written that you you could almost make free money off of them when you when you came into level two, when they came into the level two, you don't see that anymore. They they, they just got more smart, more intelligent, more sophisticated. Um, a couple of things I would say about it. One is a common question. I know this is not exactly what you asked, but a common question that I've been getting for at least 10 years now, is do you think at some point you as a human being discretionary trader, and I, I can't code, I don't have a coding background, everything I do is I, I press buttons to buy and sell. Do you think that eventually you will no longer be able to exist because of machine learning and AI and, and, and algorithms? And the answer to that is no, I think I definitely can exist. Um, I think that there's room for success for both human beings and for algorithms. I think that the key is to knowing what your advantages and disadvantages are. Like where I cannot compete is in anything that's that's ultra high frequency. Mm -hmm. I can't compete. I'm not fast enough. I mean, these algorithms can make decisions faster than the human eye can blink. I have I have no ability to be able to compete there. Um, where I can compete is I can I can adjust faster than most algorithms. And that's actually mm -hmm. probably going to be something that will improve on behalf of the algorithms as, as, as AI continues. Uh, yeah. But the way that it's been for a while, you know, we were talking about market environments early earlier, is you know, so you've come up with a strategy. Instead of doing your strategy manually, you create an algorithm to do it. You code in that algorithm. That that's going to be a code based on rules. Those rules are what defines your edge. In some ways, a, a, a really good trader is just like that is like a human being version of an algorithm where mm -hmm. I have rules that I follow for my trading and I don't deviate from those rules because when I deviate from those rules, it, it negatively impacts my, my P and L. Uh, but as long as I can be disciplined enough to follow my strategy, 
I'm actually the exact same as if I had programmed that strategy into a robot, but the benefit mm -hmm. was that I could adjust on the fly. So like, I, right. I, I still remember very clearly, uh, August 27th, 2000 and August 24th, 2015, the market had like a mini flash crash overnight. 2015, I already said it actually, uh, the market was in a very tight range almost all year. Uh, overnight that night, there was like a, a Chinese currency crisis of some sort that caused the U.S. equity market to have a massive, massive gap down. And all these algorithms had been programmed to trade this tight range-based market environment. And when the market gap below the lows of those range, that, that range, a lot of these algorithms like had like an emergency switch go off that was a risk management switch that was liquidate, liquidate, liquidate. And I'll never forget that selling for the first two and a half minutes of the day was the craziest market selling I've ever seen in, in my career. We mm -hmm. just like, like dive bombed this market lower for, for two and a half minutes. And I remember um, at that time talking to my physical trading desk before I had the virtual trading floor mm -hmm. and yelling at everybody like, We've got to buy this dip. We've got to buy this. We've got to come in and buy this. This doesn't make any sense. This is irrational. This extension, whatever it was, we got to come in and buy it. After two and a half minutes of heavy algorithmic selling, the market got bid all the way back up. Statistics came out like a couple of weeks later that showed that on that day, the algorithms were what was selling. They dumped all that stock and actually retail money was net buyers. And I love that because retail is the dumb money, right? Like you're you're in your personal brokerage account. You're, you're they can, they consider you to be dumb dumb money. In case you didn't know that already. <laughs> um, but this is the day where these brilliant algorithms all sold what ended up being the low of the year, and retail money was able to come in and buy. And that was just because we were able to adjust them on the fly because you're a human being and keep like, well, this is this isn't right. Or yeah. I remember like when, when the night fiasco happened and, and night, which was an HFT firm, somewhat like a Citadel type of company, when they, mm -hmm. they, that company entirely blew up because their algorithms went haywire one day. So um, I think that there's room for both of us to answer the final part of your question. Does T3 engage in algorithmic trading? The answer is yes. Uh, mm -hmm. We have a very robust algorithmic trading division at T3 Trading Group. Sean Hendelman is the CEO of T3. Sean has been involved in black box trading since the early 2000s. He was one of the first to get involved in the space. And, and I would even go as far as to say that a, a lot of T3 as a company and, and our success is actually based off of the success of Sean Hendelman's black box trading um, going back the last 20 years or so. So we, he, he trades, you know, server co-located, raw market data coming in. It's a very sophisticated system. All this data that comes in, it's also very expensive that he has his, you know, machines digesting and, and, and trading off of. So mm -hmm. at T3, we have the, the highest level of algorithmic trading available. And we're also, even for some of our discretionary traders, starting to use technology in a really cool way to benefit some of our, our prop traders that we have here at the company. So like if we have a, if we have a successful trader here at T3, we can actually now build an algorithm around that trader's trading. So that trader mm -hmm. continues to trade exactly as he or she always has, uh, pressing the buttons, whatever. But now we've actually built an algorithmic trading account behind your trading that can, you know, magnify your your PL, give you some extra money at the end of a at the end of a good month. So we're doing we're doing a lot of cool stuff right now. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, our next question is: do you have a preference for day trading versus swing trading? I do both. Um, I do both. I, I would say that the longer I've been in the business, the longer my holds have been. Mm -hmm. But I really think that this goes back to market environment. Um, certain market environments, your swing trading pays you more and your day trading pays you less. Certain market environments is the opposite. Uh, I like to compare and contrast 2018 compared to 2023. 2019, mm -hmm. the S&P, I think, was up 30-something percent on the year, but there was zero volatility. The biggest pullback on the market the entire year, I think, was less than 2% in the S&P. Compare that to this year where um, it's not unusual to see us up or down you know, 2% in an individual trading session in, in, mm -hmm. in an individual day. I'm talking about right. 2019. It was the entire year. In 2019, mm -hmm. you 
bought right and sat tight. You know, you bought your your breakouts, you bought little dips if they occurred, kept that stock overnight. And it just seemed like you kept making a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more on those trades. And then your day trading wasn't giving you as much. This environment's been the opposite. Unless you've got the seven stocks that have propelled the S&P higher, which are all big, big cap tech stocks, everything else that you're looking at and the S&P and the IWM have just been ranging and ranging and ranging. So if you're sitting in there in a swing position and the market's going sideways, well, that swing position is not making you any money. Uh, mm -hmm. Unless, of course, it's one of these few individual stocks that have been working really well. And we have caught some of those names as a team. Um, but otherwise, we've just been going sideways. If you can't make money day trading in this environment, if you're, you know, sitting there just in an investment account, and, and this is not a knock on investment accounts, I think having a, like a long term hold portfolio is, is a very prudent thing for people to have, but you're not making anything. And if you have day trading ability and you can capture those daily fluctuations from the intraday volatility, then you can make money. So for my own approach, I like to combine day and swing trading. I'll have core swing positions that I'll hold for weeks, months, maybe even years at a time, but I actively day trade around that core position every single day. So if I'm stuck in a market environment like right now, the day trading around the core position is what's probably making me more money. If I'm mm -hmm. stuck in an environment like 2019, that's not going to make me as much, but the swings are going are to continue to pay me better. Mm -hmm. uh, most traders and yourself included have kind of a basket of stocks that's their their bread and butter that they kind of go back to uh, all the time. First, what is kind of your basket of stocks that you're looking at day in and day out? And does that basket of stocks change based on the market environment? So is your 2019 basket different now than your 2023 basket, for example? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I would say broadly, I like to I like to trade stocks that are priced between like ten and one hundred fifty dollars. I want them to be a combination of liquid, but also things that can move that have mm -hmm. that have like a like a decent beta, but also liquid enough for me me to be able to get in and out. And I don't like them to be too expensive because as they become more expensive, I can't take as much size on positions. I like having more size rather than less size just from, from game planning perspectives. So nice. that's kind of my my broad sweet spot that I'm that I'm looking at. And the answer is is definitely yes. Things will come into and out of favor over those names. So energy is an example. Uh energy stocks, uh, I don't know, 2015 to 2021 or so. I I basically stopped looking at. Uh, mm -hmm. XLE was so boring. It was just in this continuous downtrend. People think that oil isn't going to exist anymore or whatever. Um, and then out of nowhere, you know, in like 2021 into, and then especially into 2022, uh, value became a really important thing for the market again. And value stocks were holding in, in the bear market. And there was a lot of really good value plays found within energy. And they also kind of fit that sweet spot. I've got a position in Chevron right now. I'm trading that one pretty actively. I think Oxy and Apache are, are, are really good trading vehicles. I look at them sometimes. They're kind of in my list. So yeah, definitely rotate names in and out. All right. And uh, as we approach the end of our like hour mark here, you gave yourself an A for the trading week so far. We're halfway through. We still have two sessions left and then a long weekend. Uh, for traders, no trading on Monday. Are you adjusting your strategy at all heading into the second half of this week? Are you sticking with uh, what you what you've been doing because it's been working? Sticking with what I'm doing because because it, it's been working. I will become hesitant to enter any new positions that could become swing positions as we approach the end of the week. I, I prefer for a longer weekend to not be loading up on on my portfolio of positions on Friday right before a three-day weekend, mm -hmm. uh, especially for myself. I've got a big drive coming up. I'm about to drive from, from Idaho back to New York over the course of over this weekend. So mm -hmm. uh, I don't want the extra headache of those extra positions. So I'll, I'll be cautious a little bit on new positions, but otherwise I do everything the exact same. All right. And actually, we do have one more audience question before we go. Uh, how many trades do you take each day? Do you have a rule that you stick with or you just kind of do what works? Um, I don't have a rule that I stick with. There's a lot of variability to it. I, I, I trade pretty decent volume on a day-to-day -day basis overall, mm -hmm. but how much or how little I trade depends on how I perceive the market is going to be for that trading session. 
So like if I've got a big watch list, if it's earnings season, if there's a lot of names that I'm looking at, I, I might trade a ton that day. Mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, some mornings I wake up and I look at the S&P and I'm like, like the S&P is a coin flip here. They're, we're outside of earnings season. I'm not finding any good news names that I can focus on today that have an edge outside of the market. The best thing I can do today is sit on my hands, manage my swing positions and not do anything too new. Mm -hmm. So I do that on other days also. So there can be a pretty dramatic difference day to day on just how many trades I take. It, it's also hard for me to answer that question because if I am day trading around a core swing position, is every time I buy and sell within that position count as a trade? Or is that just mm -hmm. one big picture trade that I'm continuing to manage? If mm -hmm. it's the, the former, then you could say I do a lot of trades every day. Mm -hmm. If yeah. it's the latter, then you could say I don't I, I only do a few new trades a day. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that'd be the answer. All right. Uh, for everyone who is still here with us live, I just put a comment in the chat uh, for, for the with the link for next week's event. Uh, T3 Live's David Prince will be joining me next week. He's the leader of the uh, Inner Circle Virtual Trading Floor up over at T3 Live. Not a trader with T3 Trading Group, but has some great market insights uh, for traders. And so we're going to bring him on as a guest. Derek, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, today, for everyone that's watching us, if you want to connect with Derek, I know you can reach out to him on LinkedIn, uh, make that connection. He'd be happy to talk to anyone uh, here on LinkedIn that was with us on this event. And Derek will be back with me in about a month as well. So you'll get to hear from him again and see what's changed in a month from now in the stock market. Things can, can change, might be the same. Who knows? But thank you, Derek, for joining me today. Thanks, Reddit.